This week's topic is one of my favorites, it's floods, and we've just gotten through a series of big floods down in Texas, so flooding has been all over the news, so it's certainly a, a timely topic to discuss. Um, you can see some pictures here from your book and, and that I've taken off the internet of some flooding uh, that has occurred, and you can see flooding basically is when a river leaves its banks and, uh, and covers the surrounding area. So our questions for the week, you'll recognize these again. Um, would you live in a flood prone area? What level of risk from flooding is acceptable to you? The second part of course is how would you know if the flood risk was assessed accurately and we'll talk about how that risk is assessed and how it's published and shared. Um, what should be done to prepare for the hazard and prevent catastrophe? So what should people and communities do uh, to prepare for the flood hazard? So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, what causes the flood hazard to vary? Well, um, one thing is we have a couple different types of flooding. So downstream floods are occur when you have a lot of rainfall over usually an extended period of time, typically several days or even longer. Um, for example, if you want to make the Mississippi River flood on the lower part of the Mississippi, you have to have a lot of rain upstream over the course of usually several weeks at least. The other type of flood which you can see on the right side is a flash flood. This is the kind of flooding we have in our area, um, especially along small streams where you might get a very intense rainfall um, over just a few hours or less than a day typically and the water rises up very quickly and it also falls very quickly. Um, so this is kind of typical in upland areas in Illinois. If you look at a major river like the Illinois River, you're looking at a more downstream type, downstream type flood. Uh, one of the things you want to keep in the back of your mind is that a lot of the stuff that we talk about here um, looks at the history of flooding and that means how flooding occurred in the climate regime that we had. So as the climate changes, we would expect the flooding to change. And so that impacts our ability to forecast future flooding. So you would want to keep that in mind as, as we go through this. Also, changes in the drainage basin or the area drained by a river um, will change the kind of floods that that river produces. <laughs> The primary cause of flooding, of course, is heavy rainfall. Um, you can think of a river system, all the little tributaries that collect the water and bring them into the main river. Um, heavy rainfall into that system can overwhelm the, the ability of that system to handle the water and you get flooding. If we look very closely, one of the things that we see is we usually get flooding when the rate at which the rain falls exceeds the ability of the soil to soak it up and that's called the infiltration capacity of the soil. So when the rain falls faster than the soil can soak it up we get water running across the ground into local streams and then they go down into the main river. So here's a picture of a drainage basin and it's simply the area that contributes to the river. And so if we want to understand flooding in a river system, we really have to understand the drainage basin itself. Um, how big is it? What's the area of that drainage basin? The bigger the area, the more water it can collect. How dense are the streams in that drainage basin? So this particular one that they have a picture of here doesn't have a very high drainage density but you can imagine a lot more small little streams coming off of these um, main rivers on here would allow it to collect the water more quickly and so usually if you have a higher drainage density or density of little streams then you can get a higher flood potential. How permeable is the soil? How easily does it soak up the rainwater? If it doesn't soak up the water then you're going to get more runoff and a greater potential for flooding. Um, 
And the last point listed on here is relief. And relief just is a comparison of the highest to the lowest elevations. If there's a lot of elevation change in a drainage basin, we usually get a lot more runoff. Um, if you have steep slopes, the water just runs down the slope and doesn't have a chance to soak in. If you have flat ground, when the rain lands on that, the water can have more of an opportunity to soak in. There are other characteristics that we could look at, such as vegetation, um, and some of those are discussed in the book. But when we're trying to understand this system that produces a flood, um, we want to know as much as we can about what's going on inside that dotted line or inside the drainage basin. And we can put that information into a model uh, that will allow us to forecast floods after rain has fallen. Another term you need to learn is floodplain. And a floodplain, very simply, is the flat area next to a river. However, that is somewhat of an oversimplification um, because for our purposes, we want to know if it's actually subject to flooding. And so we can look at it physically and see the flat area by a river, um, but we also want to analyze it and say, is this area likely to flood um, given a certain amount of rainfall? And one of the functions of this is that it stores flood water. Um, and so that flat area next to the river that is subject to flooding stores flood water. All these things are linked together. Um, it's important to know that when you look at that middle bullet, um, we're going to talk about something called a return interval. Um, but it's how likely is that area subject to flooding? How likely is it to flood? So. Um, in a given year, does it have a 1% chance of flooding, a 10% chance, a 50% chance of flooding? And that will come into the legal definition of the floodplain. And the legal definition of the floodplain de very often determines uh, what people are allowed to do um, within that um, area. So. Here are the hazards that we're looking at. Um, flooding, obviously, is the big hazard, which is, you know, if you get water in your house or your car gets surrounded by water, that can cause a lot of damage. Uh, in addition to that, though, that water typically brings a lot of sediment with it. And so the sediment is kind of a secondary hazard and causes damage that kind of lasts after the water goes away and can cause a lot of problems in terms of cleaning things up. Floods can also cause erosion, and this is a part of the hazard that a lot of people don't think of. Um, but the flood's water, if it's going fast enough, can pick things up and move it. It can erode sediment, and it can even pick up buildings and move those. On the right-hand side are some of the kind of secondary hazards or secondary results. It can disrupt transportation. You can get disease occurring as water maybe moves um, dirty sediments into places where you don't want it, agricultural losses, people have to move away, that kind of thing. So what places are at risk? Well, um, the two maps I have here from your book, the, probably the most interesting one is in the lower right-hand corner. Um, it shows how many presidential disaster declarations related to flooding there were um, over the course of about 40 years. And you can see almost every county in the United States had at least one um, presidential disaster declaration related to flooding. This is a very common hazard and it's found in most parts of the United States. So how do we forecast a flood? Well, we use the history of flooding along a river uh, to forecast the flood. And this process is discussed in your textbook, so I encourage you to read this. But I'm going to walk through it very quickly. They use a very, very simple example. When we do this professionally, we would want a lot more years of record. What you do is you take 
the floods that you have a record of, the biggest flood each year. You rank those floods, that's the column that's labeled M, um, from the largest to smallest, where M is the biggest, um, number one is the biggest, and two is the second biggest, and so on. You then do a calculation that they show on the right-hand side to get what we call the recurrence interval. And the recurrence interval is the number of years of record, in this case it's nine, plus one, the plus is missing on this slide, and then it's divided by the rank of the flood. So if we look at the um, 1996 flood, you'll notice we would take nine years of record plus one, which is ten. We divide it by the rank of the flood, which is number one, and we get a recurrence interval of ten. And what that really means is there's a 10% chance in any given year, or a 1 in 10 chance in any given year, that that flood will occur again. Now, you can see how dependent we are on our years of record. The more years of record we have, the more accurate this will be. One way to examine this and kind of extend our record is to plot the recurrence interval with the discharge on a graph, as you have on the right-hand side. You then connect the dots with a line, and you can extend that line to see what floods with a greater recurrence interval are likely to be. You can also use this to check the accuracy of your forecast. If it's a curve like this, you might say, you know, that thing that we called the 10-year flood looks awfully big compared to those other ones. And maybe, maybe we should plot it out farther as the 20-year flood and flatten our curve out. So that's the other way that we use this graphing. Um, in the United States, there aren't a lot of streams that we have 100 years of record on. So we might have 50 or 60, and it becomes very important to plot those things out so that we can use that to forecast our 100-year flood, or the flood that has a 1 in 100 chance of occurring each year. That's the flood that you will see depicted on flood insurance rate maps, which I'm uh, give you directions to find in our resources for the week. So what else can we do? Well, we can, it turns out, predict floods. Um, we model our drainage basin. And with that, if we know the permeability of the streams and the drainage density and the relief, what we can do is we can measure rainfall using radar, put that into our model, and forecast where exactly the water level will be several days in the future. And so this is a... Uh, this is taken from a flood forecast from the National Weather Service site. So somewhere in our, in our web resources, we have a link to this uh, information as well. But if, it's at weather.gov, and you can look at uh, river forecasts there. And that's very useful because we can tell people several days ahead of time whether or not the water is going to rise to a level where they would need to evacuate or put down sandbags. Some other things that we can do in response to the flood hazard is we can try to control the flooding. This has uh, limited success because it kind of depends on how high the water comes. We can uh, put levees along rivers. Again, if the water doesn't go too high and overtop our levee. In the upper right-hand corner, those are examples of flood retention ponds. The retention pond is meant to make up for the fact that when we pave areas, um, Obviously, the rain can't soak into the ground, and so we need to do something to kind of hang on to that water. We've learned that we can't just let it go straight into the stream. So retention ponds have become an important component in flood control. We can also zone places. We can tell people, hey, this place is safe to build. This place is not safe to build. There's a really nice discussion in your textbook about this and about flood hazard mapping. And <clears throat> so this is kind of where I'm going to wrap it up. There's some more information in your book about the human impact
on the flood hazard and that's something of course that we need to keep in mind um, as we plan for the flood.